Hello, my name is Dr. Joseph Sullivan, and I'm a pediatric epileptologist and director of the University of California, San Francisco Pediatric Epilepsy Center of Excellence. I'm going to give you a very brief overview of some of the disease-modifying therapies in Dravet syndrome that are in various stages of clinical development. Before doing so, I think it's important to at least touch upon what it actually means to be disease-modifying, because in the literature, there's not really a widely accepted definition although there's this theme that it should go beyond symptom management. If we are trying to be disease modifying, it also goes without saying that we should understand as well as possible the actual natural history of the disease that we're trying to modify so that we know if our intervention is actually changing uh, that trajectory and achieving our ultimate treatment goal. In multiple sclerosis, there's some definitions about the delay of accumulation of disability or slowing of progression of disease that are considered to be disease modifying. But unfortunately, there's not a widely accepted definition for this for Dravet syndrome. So for the purpose of this very brief overview, I'm gonna to choose to define it as improving the underlying SCN1A dysfunction that results from the insufficient state to ideally improve symptoms beyond just seizures, including cognition, sleep, behavior, and motor impairment. These are the three compounds that I'm gonna to briefly touch upon as they currently stand in the middle of 2022. The first is STK001. And what this cartoon is trying to show is what happens in a uh, Dravet syndrome cell, or in fact, any cell um, that has uh, half low insufficiency. So in the green here is the normal wild type gene that undergo undergoes the DNA to messenger RNA um, processing where we get the pre-messenger RNA, subsequent splicing, and then translation into protein. What you can see here is after splicing, there is this non-productive mRNA transcript that has this little light blue uh, segment in here, which is the nonsense mediated decay exon. What ends up happening with this non-productive mRNA, because of the presence of this exon, it undergoes cellular degradation and therefore is never translated into functional protein whereas the splice transcript that does not harbor that NMD exon undergoes normal uh, translation and we see the protein. Of course, when you actually have the, the mutated uh, gene that results in loss of function, this whole mechanism is still uh, intact, but there it's impaired because the read through never actually happens and therefore no protein is actually uh, produced. In the presence of STK001, because of this tango, so targeted augmentation of nuclear gene output, we now then, uh, again, have the normal state here uh, on the left. Uh, and you'll note here that we're not targeting the mutated gene here. So that previously shown red gene is not in this cartoon. But when the tango ASO is added, shown by this little um, uh, red <clears throat> uh, figure here, it's gonna bind to the NMD exon and essentially say, now you can use me, make me from non-productive mRNA with the NMD exon present into productive mRNA. And what that effectively translates into is now we have twice as much of the productive mRNA around so that we can restore that haploinsufficient haplo state from 50% up to 100%. A different ASO approach is being developed by the CAMP4, uh, looking at the CMP SCN001. Um, and this is also an ASO, um, but it's targeting a different set of regulatory, and, uh, regulatory RNAs. It's well known um, that there are many regulatory RNAs that uh, essentially attract these inhibitors of transcription resulting in decreased pronix, protein expression. And the hypothesis is, is that this is the way the cell may um, regulate gene expression. And in Dravet syndrome, there's a very specific type of regulatory RNA called this natural antisense transcript or abbreviated NAT. So in the normal uh, state here, and this is true for many genes, there are these inhibitors that are going to regulate the SCN, uh, regulate gene, um, regulatory uh, RNA that's going to regulate, regulate the RNA transcription, in this case, the SCN1A gene, so the gene expression is in that sort of low to medium range. In the presence of this, this ASO, however, it can block the natural antisense transcript, 
thereby allowing the transcription and RNA expression to lead to a higher state as, um, as shown here in the green. So that sort of you increase uh, that expression. So therefore this could actually be a very attractive uh, treatment for the heflin sufficiency um, that is seen uh, in Dravet syndrome. The third and final approach is not an ASO approach, rather is an adeno-associated viral vector, which shown in this cartoon binds to the, the cellular membrane, um, is um, uh, taken up by the cell, and this, this episome, which contains um, this transcription factor, um, will now bind to the actual DNA. So now we're, we're targeting the actual DNA, and we're targeting the wild-type uh, DNA, here, although it will bind to both, what we really want to do is bind upstream of the uh, SCN1A gene and, and increase the functional messenger RNA um, output so that it is then translated into more SCN1A protein and it's inserted into the cellular membrane and becomes uh, functional. Uh, one way to show this is kind of uh, an analogy of an assembly line. So. Um, here is an unaffected individual, has two functional copies of the SCM1A gene, and like in an assembly line, they're churning out these widgets, and in this cartoon, it's showing three widgets per assembly line. In Dravet syndrome, however, one of those um, chromosomes, one of those genes, um, has a mutation that leads to a loss of function. Therefore, that assembly line breaks down and is not producing any widgets, or in this case, any, any messenger RNA or any, uh, therefore, uh, any functional SCM1A protein. Whereas the working copy is still putting out its three widgets. And so this is how we end up at the 50%. In the presence of ETX 101, again, it's not doing anything to sort of quote unquote fix uh, the mutated gene. Rather, it's binding to the wild type gene and telling that assembly line to pick up the pace a bit. So put out more widgets, put out more messenger RNA so that that can then be translated uh, into functional SCN1A protein. And that's the goal uh, of this, this intervention. And so in summary, um, this is a, a super exciting time as we enter this exciting new area uh, era of epilepsy treatment with the potential to treat more than just seizures. Hopefully I've shown you that there are uh, three um, different uh, approaches um, that are in various stages of development that overall uh, end result is to upregulate uh, the uh, functional SCN1A channels. And each of these compounds are in various stages of clinical development, either with studies that are actively recruiting or plan to be recruiting in the very near future to ideally determine the optimal dosing and of course, uh, uh, overall safety. And I think the big um, uh, unanswered question here remains uh, is to what extent can we be disease modifying and are there going to be any other clinical variables such as age of when the treatment is, is instituted that are important to overall outcomes? Thank you for your time.